Good morning and welcome again to this, our fifth online church service. I trust that you are all well, in good health and indeed in good spirits. Today we find ourselves back in our series in John's Gospel following our Easter interlude. And this week we're going to be considering John chapter 9. But before we turn to look at that, I thought it would just be useful if we just spent a moment reminding ourselves of where we've got to in the narrative. Four weeks ago now, Willie spoke to us from the latter section of chapter 8, a chapter which details how Jesus went to preach in the temple following the feast. And whilst he was there, he answered many questions that were put to him, and he told the people quite unequivocally that he was the Son of God. However, on hearing these proclamations, the people became angered, and they attempted to stone Jesus. Jesus, however, left their presence unharmed. And now we come to to chapter 9 where Jesus is exiting the temple and we have this fascinating account of Jesus performing a miracle on a blind man. Julia has already kindly read for us the bulk of this passage, but please have your Bibles open so that you can follow with me. And I thought it would be helpful again if we were able just to skim through the sections to familiarise ourselves with the text. The passage begins with Jesus walking a blind, by a blind man. Upon seeing him, the, the disciples in their curiosity ask Jesus, how is this man blind? Is he blind because of sins that he has committed? Or is he blind because of the sins of his parents? In response, Jesus gently refutes their thinking. This man is blind so that the works of God may be performed in him, he tells them. Jesus then proceeds to give the man his sight, and then we enter into a period of dialogue from verse 8 through to the end of the chapter, where various people come to try and understand the answer to two questions. Firstly, how did this man have his sight restored? And then secondly, who is this Jesus? And on whose authority does he heal? And so today I've entitled today's message, Unblind to His Purposes. And the reason I've called it that is because the blind man in our passage is not just made unblind from his physical impairment, but he is also made unblind by the grace of God from his spiritual blindness. And as we read in the passage, he seems to be the only one of our characters therein who actually achieves spiritual sight. He seems to be the only one who recognises the purposes of Jesus. And so as we look at our text, I would like to consider the narrative under three headings. Firstly, the purpose to the blindness. Secondly, the blindness to the purpose. And then thirdly, made unblind by the purpose. So firstly, purpose in the blindness. As I've already mentioned, our passage opens with an intriguing conversation between Jesus and his disciples where they ask about the cause of a man's blindness. Jesus, however, challenges their thinking by saying, it is not this man's sin or indeed his parents' sin that have caused or purpose for this man to be blind. Rather, it is by God's design. That thinking was was alien to the disciples because they had been influenced and steeped in the teachings of the rabbis and the Pharisees who had created this misconception that disease and impairment were the result purely of personal sin. And of course, it doesn't work like that. We are all sinners, all broken Just because one of us happens to be less healthy physically than another doesn't make that person's sin any greater or any less, for we have all fallen short. Jesus, in his answering of the disciples, dispels this misconception by citing straight to the chase and saying, this is about the works of God. The purpose of this man's blindness is to reveal the miraculous power of God through me, the Son. This is going to substantiate the claim that I have, Jesus being the Messiah, God himself. And I'm going to perform a creative miracle here so that it becomes clear to everyone that I am the one 
who created as John begins his gospel. God in his sovereignty has prepared a vessel to put himself on display through me, Jesus, right now. You see, our Heavenly Father is a planner. When God ordains for something to happen, it's not reactionary in response to human causes, but he is planning and executing his purposes all the time. This is one of the great mysteries of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Time is but of a word to him. He knows our actions and our motives even before we do. And the implication for this for our lives is profound. Because no matter what mess we are in or what pain we are in, the causes of that mess and of that pain are not decisive in explaining it. What is decisive in explaining it is God's purpose. Yes, there are causes, some of them which are our fault, perhaps some of them which may not be. But those causes are not decisive in determining the meaning of our mess and our, of our pain. What is decisive is God's purpose. Verse 3, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God may be displayed in him. And if we will confess our sins and hold fast to Jesus as our rock and as our redeemer and as our riches, then God's purpose for our mess and our pain will be a good purpose. It will be worth everything that we must endure. And we know this is true because God says it to be true. Later in Romans 8 and 28, Paul would say, And we know that for those who love God and all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. But this truth, while we, while we know it to be true deep down in our hearts, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes it's a difficult truth to embrace. I'm sure we can all think of examples where we or people we hold dear to us have suffered in unimaginable ways through illness, through lack of work, at the hands of others or by impairment. And it can be difficult in those situations when you're knee deep in the anguish, the hurt, the torment to bring yourself to see a heavenly perspective, to realise that God has purpose in our blindness. Even when we look at the passage, we can see that even Jesus' disciples, who had spent lots of time in his company, were still prone to thinking in their default mindset. And I'm not saying that we should oversimplify the words of Romans 8, for it definitely doesn't mean don't let life get you down. God's going to make everything better for you and your time here on earth. There is no biblical basis for that. In fact, 1 Peter 4 and 12 tells us that life won't always be happy, rich and full. Sometimes we are meant to suffer. And it's in the midst of that suffering that God's working and purposes are most often displayed. We want to trust that God is working even through our trials to bring about his will. And there's plenty of biblical evidence for that to back up that cause for hope. The story of Joseph being one of the clearest examples. If you recall his story, Joseph was severely beaten, left for dead and sold into slavery by his brothers. He endured the illicit advances of his bo boss's wife and he was thrown into prison after she made false accusations against him. Joseph lingered in prison for years before he was released and brought into the council of Pharaoh himself. And at that time he was given a position of leadership in which the Lord used him to spare Egypt and countless communities surrounding it, including his own family, from the Great Famine. And at the end of the story, as he reconciles with the brothers who kick-started off all of this suffering, he acknowledges God's sovereign hand working through it all. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. There was purpose in the blindness of Joseph's situation. 
And stories like Joseph's and our current narrative about this blind man give us confidence that God is always working behind the scenes to bring about his will, even if it's some, simply sometimes only to enhance our own spiritual growth. James 1 says that the Lord allows us to suffer through trials. That's the Spirit's refining, sanctifying work which can often be painful. But the spiritual fruit it bears is well worth the struggle. And even though the road ahead is foggy, and sometimes the things on the peripheral blurry, our focus should be on Jesus recognising that he has good purposes for those who believe in him and that there is purpose in our trials, our sufferings and even in this strangely odd situation we find ourselves in with regard to coronavirus. God is a planner and he has purposes for us in the blindness. Secondly then, the blindness to the purpose Aside from Jesus, his disciples and the blind man, we have three other groups of people in our narrative. We have the neighbours who appear in verse 8. We have the Pharisees who enter the scene in verse 13. And we have the blind man's parents referenced in verse 18. All these people come into our narrative following the blind man's healing. And all unfortunately react in a way that is blind to the purposes of Jesus. Firstly, we have the neighbours who in their incredulity fail to really accept that the healed man is the man whom they used to know. Verse 9, some say, is it he? Others say, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. Verse 10 says, so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? The man replies, I don't know. Perplexed, irritated and probably somewhat uncertain, the neighbours decide to take the healed man to the people they see as knowledgeable, to the Pharisees. And when we think upon the neighbour's action. It's easy to draw parallels as we consider how sometimes we are prone to acting in certain circumstances, rather than just believing and trusting in Jesus. When we come to face up to a challenge, who do we turn to for our strength? Do we turn to advice of self-help books or to people who we assume are in the know? Or do we come to the cross and meditate on his word and petition his throne? Is our hope for help and sustenance and endurance and wisdom set firmly in Christ our rock? Or are we prone to leaning on something that is going to give way? Psalm 46 assures us that God should be our crutch. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. The second group of people who we are then introduced to are the Pharisees whom the neighbours bring the blind man to. And we have two exchanges recorded with them. In the first exchange from, from verse 13 through 17, the Pharisees have just been brought the blind man and they've listened to his claims that he has had his sight restored. When inquiring of the detail, the Pharisees learned that the miracle that the man alleges to have occurred happened on the Sabbath. And almost immediately, a section of them moved to shut down any notion that the healer could be of God. How can he be of God, they exclaim? If he was to perform a miracle on the Sabbath, you can't work and create mud or clay on such a day. And just like that, they closed their hearts to any reason. Yet it was not coincidence that this miracle occurred on the Sabbath. Jesus defines the Sabbath. 
Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8 says this, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus here, by healing the man on the Sabbath, he was fulfilling his very design for the Sabbath. He healed the man on this day to show that what the point of Sabbath rest is. The point of Sabbath rest is healing. That's why you rest. You rest to heal. The point of Sabbath rest is that we are helpless and God creates, God sustains, God heals. We don't. What day could have been better for God in flesh, God incarnate, Jesus, to find a broken man and to heal him, to give him and his family rest from all the struggles of his blindness? That's what the Sabbath is for, God exalting blessing to a broken and weary human And that's why today, Sunday, the Sabbath, as we sit in our lockdown and isolation, that we should be careful to remind ourselves that this day isn't about do's and don'ts, but rather it's to be a day that's focused on finding rest in our healer, our sustainer and our maker. That's what we are to do today. The second exchange with the Pharisees then follows. And in this exchange, the Pharisees called the healed man's parents as witnesses, and then eventually again the healed man to further interrogate his claims. And following a lengthy dialogue in which they assert that Jesus is a sinner, that they themselves are the true disciples, for for they follow Moses and the law, they eventually get to a point where they become so infuriated with the healed man's defence of Jesus that they cast him out and rather pointedly express to him, you were born in utter sin and would you teach us? The Pharisees thought they knew it. They were so learned and steeped in their in their Jewish history, that they failed to see the most obvious fulfilment of it in front of them. Their arrogance was such that it would justify their guilt. Verse 41, Jesus says to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now you say, we see, your guilt remains, for they were blind. To the purpose. Isn't there so much in this that reminds you of today? The outlook of our generation where we think that our science has cracked the origins of life, where we think that we are beyond the confines of earth and able to travel to the realms of this universe, where we are able to clone animals and make things in absurd quantities where our moral compass is open to reorientation and our schools filled with enlightened progressiveness is this a generation that says we see whilst in the midst of it all is blind to the only one who is truly able to give us sight and if we can relate to this is it not our calling through the scripture to witness to those who claim to see and to help them to actually open up their eyes to Jesus. In our narrative, the healed man's parents knew their son had been healed, yet they were too timid to really embrace the reality. Verse 19, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see, the Pharisees ask of them? And his parents answer, we know that this is our son. And that he was born blind. But how he sees we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can speak for himself. Verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ. He was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said. Ask him. He is of age. Are we ever given to being like the man's parents? Are we blind to the purpose of God to seek and save people just like us? 
when we have been transformed by the grace of Jesus, when our spiritual sight has been bestowed upon us, it is our calling, it is our commandment, it is our responsibility to let others know about the transformation that is readily available solely through him. There was purpose in the blindness. There was blindness to the purpose. And now finally, made unblind by the purpose. There are two ways in which this man in our narrative becomes an unblind man. At the start of the passage, we observe that his physical sight has been given unto him. But by the end of the passage, we come to know that Jesus has also revealed himself to the man such that he believes in him. Verse 35, Jesus asks him, do you believe in the son of man? The man answers, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said, you have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. The man says this, this beautiful phrase, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. In both ways, the man has been given his sight, physical and spiritual, by Jesus. And it's an important thing to remember that it is Jesus who seeks out and saves the lost. Verse 1, as he, that's Jesus, passed by, he, Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. Jesus is the seeker and he seeks out in this passage to save the man both from his physical impairment and his spiritual impairment. That is why I would like us to consider this man as being made unblind by the purpose. For the purpose is Jesus the one sent to the world by God to bring light into the darkness. Blindness in our narrative well illustrates our own spiritual darkness and lostness. Helpless from the start, the blind man in our story is at the mercy of somebody coming up and choosing to help him. He's like us, the sinner. God takes the initiative through Jesus with the blind man. And God has to take the initiative through Jesus for us, the sinner. That's how grace operates. We are lost, we are dead, we're blind, we know no truth, we see no Christ, we have no God. Yet God sees us. And he comes to us in compassion and grace and bestows sight. He makes the blind see by and through and for his purpose. What a testimony of love. What a testimony of mercy that God would send his only son to come down and help us see. You will notice that all of this is by God's design. God is a planner. Is it any coincidence that the name of the pool that the man washes in is called Siloam, which means sent? Does this not point to Jesus? The one sent by the Father to seek and save and to restore sight. God has purposes for us in our blindness. He asks us not to be blind to them. He asks us to rely on him, to seek him, to ask him to reveal more of himself to us. He was the one who first sought us and he is the sole reason that we can have a certain future. As the great hymn Amazing Grace says, we once were lost but now we are found. We were blind but now we see. T'was grace that taught our hearts to fear and grace our fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour we first believed. Through many dangers, toils and snares we have already come. T'was grace that brought us safe thus far. And grace will lead us home. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved wretches like us.